The stock market is a curious beast. People spend their whole lifetimes trying to study it and it still doesn't make sense to them. For example, you might do research on a company that suggests the stock price could triple or quadruple in the next five years. For example, at the moment, PayPal stock is sitting at a forward P ratio of about 14.3. However, the five year average for this is sitting at about a 51 P ratio, meaning that historical data currently suggests that we should be tripling our money if you invest in PayPal for the medium term. Now, full disclosure, I do have a position in PayPal and I'm not actually saying that is guaranteed to happen. That's what the data suggests is likely to happen. So the whole point of today's video is to explain one potential reason why data is not always the thing that you should trust in terms of investing. It's just one piece of the puzzle. And that's why likely professional money managers earn so much money. You have to pay five figures for them to manage your money sometimes. One reason why the stock price might not agree with that data is there's just so many data points out there. Rather than looking at just pure profitability, they could be looking at things like revenue or maybe how much loans the company has and they don't wanna to touch it if the company has too many toxic debts. But the second reason why the stock price might disagree with your thesis is due to short-term sentiment or confidence of investors. And that's what today's video is all about, looking at the confidence of really two groups of investors, just splitting everyone up into two groups, those being dumb money, basically me and you, hello there. But then you have the smart money, which is those big investors that probably earn millions of dollars in commission per year and manage billions of dollars. Who has more money invested in the market and who pushes it around more? Well, typically dumb money is about 10 to 20% of stock market volumes, depending on basically how well, typically retail investors or dumb money makes up 10 to 20% of the stock market, meaning that professional investors are somewhere around 80 to 90%. But I don't think that's as clear cut as those percentages suggest. Not all professional investors are those long-term buyers that just buy stock like Berkshire Hathaway and hold it for 50 years. There's probably a sub portion of those professional investors, smart money, that are traders kind of like we are, that typically only hold positions for roughly six months or less. So a rough rule of thumb that I typically use here, I know this isn't supported by data at this moment, but I often find that about 50% of money is this short-term trading in nature that's more retail-led. And then you have maybe another 50% of professional investors that are the long-term buyers and often are the ones that find the bottoms in the market. Today, we're going to look at five different time periods of the SP500 and its relationship with dumb and smart money confidence to try and see, well, which group of investors are usually more correct than the other. So we're gonna look at the last five years because that was overall a very interesting time in the stock market all the way back to 2019. And then we're gonna look at the GFC and then finally the dot-com bubble bust as our three time periods of interest. Okay, let's start with the smart money here. So going all the way back through to 2018, 2019, we saw that smart money confidence in terms of relative buying really was finding a low right around those highs at 2019 at the end of the year. We then went into a sell off due to the Rona crisis. And we see here that smart money confidence was rising that entire time period, meaning they effectively bought the bottom there and then rode that entire wave through 2020 and 21, where the stock market effectively almost doubled. The confidence in smart money buying really dropped off a cliff, probably because they used up all their dry powder during 2020, meaning that they just had to fall in terms of that relative confidence. They already spent all their excess cash went into low confidence and then it started rising again towards 2021. So this is the one area I would say that smart money did not do very well because they were starting to buy the tops at around that 2021, 2022 timeframe. Probably that fear in the Russia Ukraine crisis really thought, hey, this could be a short term bottom, let's buy in. But they actually bought in at almost the worst time around March of 2022. There was a short term dip, maybe a 10% drop there. But we did manage to fall about another 20% almost from those sort of short-term lows there. But the entire time smart money was buying those dips. And then you can see that as we had that bottom really in October, mainly due to the fears of inflation, and we had 30 year fixed interest rates spiking, that led a lot of fear in the market, but that really bottomed in October of 2022. 
And that was really the peak in smart investor buying and then it's dropped in confidence really ever since. And they've probably just been a moderate buyer, moderate seller ever since then on average. Dumb Money was buying in consistently all the way through those moderate highs of 2019, but it actually had minimum confidence during 2020. So you can see here, even though retail typically only is constituting about 20% of the market, they were the main sellers during 2020, which led to probably about 30% drop in the S&P 500 that was all due to a drop in dumb money. So you can think of even if they only have about 20% of the entire stock market, dumb money's just irrationality and emotions usually lead to short-term really violent swings in stock prices. So dumb money actually did all right in the end, but not quite as good as smart money. And then if we just have a clean look at 2021, 2022, during that bumpy time period, it was really dumb money that was driving the short-term highs in the market, but then also the short-term lows. For example, dumb money was selling very hard that crash in October last year. But then we've been buying up this really um, gain in the stock market ever since. So since those bottoms, we've had about a 25% gain in the stock market. And a lot of that was from the gain in both smart and dumb money. So usually what we see here is that dumb money often fluctuates the market. Smart money often buys up the bottoms, but we have these rare moments where both groups start stepping in to buy the market. Kind of like what we saw in October, smart money was still buying hard. Dumb money actually turned around in confidence. And that's when you can get these real nice swings up in stock prices. Okay, so the next time point is the GFC timeframe all the way from 2005 leading up to the crash of 2009. So who was buying up into that crash and then who really sold it off in 2008, 2009? So smart money here was relatively not really that confident going into 2006, 2007. During that time, we were seeing pretty nice increases in interest rates, which often scares smart money. But they were actually buying in in 2007, which is quite funny to see there. They actually bought in at the highs of the market and then slowly as the market sold off, smart money also was selling during that time, but they started buying in heavy about halfway through that crash, but then they got scared again in 2009. So even smart money was a bit irrational, kind of like dumb money probably will be in a second. Let's have a quick look here. So dumb money, let's see what they were doing. They were kind of doing the same thing here, buying up some of those short-term highs in 2006, 2007, and then going into the short-term bounce, 2008, dumb money was buying in. And then we had a lack of confidence all the way through really 2008 going into 2009. And then as we came out of that bottom, so did dumb money's confidence. They started buying back up again, whereas smart money actually didn't buy that bottom there. They had a rough buying period in 2009. And switching back to dumb money here, that they really are the ones that drove that bounce up in prices, driving up the market something like 30, 40%. All right, the final time point here is the dot-com bubble bust. Let's see what's going on there. So we see that during that time leading up to uh, really 2001, which was the beginning of that recession, we're having a bouncing around in confidence for smart money. Overall, you could say it was probably neutral leading up to that point. And then as we were selling off during that crisis, smart money actually did quite well. They bought the relative bottom in 2001. Then they were buying up just before the bottom in 2002. And then there were sort of relative sellers during the initial gains in 2003. And then they started buying up the bottom of 2004, which led on for another bull market for about three more years there. So overall smart money did quite well with that recession there. Let's see what dumb money was doing. Dumb money was kind of consistently just average leading up to the crash. And then it started really buying the bottoms in 2003. So you can really see here that even though smart money might be more tactical buying up some of those bottoms, it probably just doesn't have that conviction just absolutely force the stock market in a certain direction. So that irrationality sometimes of dumb money can even pull us out of recession in terms of stock prices anyway. Now to finish off the video, I'm just gonna make a few comments about where potentially smart money versus dumb money could be positioning right now. And if you see smart money starting to pick up again and dumb money go down, which sectors could be hit worse than others? And just full disclosure, at this point, this is pure speculation right now, not to be supported too much by data, just my personal opinion, just to make that very clear there. So let's get into those charts here. We see here with the QQQs, the NASDAQ 100, full of tech companies, high growth companies. That's the yellow line. The green line is an equal weighting S&P 500. In other words, they have a larger share of small companies, usually more stable companies that are maybe not as tech related. They have 
much more of a say in that green price there. Over the course of 2023, the NASDAQ is up 35%, but that equal weighting ETF there is actually flat or slightly down after today. And if we break apart the sectors of the SP 500 in a bit more detail here, the yellow is still that sort of NASDAQ type index. That is actually the tech sector ETF XLK. We have in the middle there, the green is just the SP 500, just the broad stock market average of America. The orange is the food staples ETF XLP and the blue is the utility ETF XLU. Again, this chart is one day old and a few of these actually safer ETFs, the orange and the blue sold off another one or 3% respectively. And just to mention this second chart is going right before the Rona crisis, just so we get to see who's actually performed in the last really three years in more of a longer term picture now. You see that the tech sector is again done very well, but you probably expect that since the Rona crash really, because a lot of tech companies were preferentially a bit stronger, they could still obtain profit. Whereas a lot of brick and mortar stores, maybe old school companies uh, couldn't actually obtain the same amount of profit and revenue during that time. But the utilities after today are down roughly 10% since before Rona. Think of all that inflation that's happened. Utility energy prices have gone up 10, 15, 20% since then. Yet utilities are actually down in terms of stock prices. Food staple companies are only up 10%, even with all that food inflation driving up short-term profits so in terms of where professional investors might be seeking to put money they're usually a bit more tactical think a bit more longer term potentially i see these more safer etfs these more safer sectors of the market as a potential target for these professional investors and we've seen that smart money has been fleeing the stock market really over the last couple months here but they're starting to buy back in that could be a beautiful target for them and we could see a nice bounce in their price kind of like what we saw throughout 2022 where we saw both the consumer staples xlp and the xlu utilities jump up in price about 20 30 percent in terms of the entire broad average of those sectors whereas dumb money is dropping down in confidence and we know dumb money loves the big names like microsoft tesla nvidia and we've seen that xlk is full of those names so here is a list of all those companies in that etf xlk you got your apple microsoft nvidia even adobe salesforce all companies that are loved by dumb money so potentially as we see dumb money leave the market qqq xlk could drop who knows 10 15 percent i know they're darlings at the moment but think of what happened in 2022 no one really expected those beloved names to fall 30 40 percent and yet they did so again this is pure speculation here here, but relative performance for the next six, nine, 12 months, maybe we're gonna see these safer sectors outperform the tech sector. And especially if we have a recession pop up, I believe that is going to be the case. Again, my pure speculation here, but if we manage to avoid recession, these tech companies do very well during a healthy economy. So they'll likely outperform. Those are my current thoughts at the moment. If you enjoyed today's video, why not consider subscribing? So that way you get nice constant access to these videos. I've actually got another video for you in the top right. If you wanna watch that one there, it's chosen just for you by the YouTube algorithm. I'll see you in the next, bye.